Good afternoon, everybody. We're ready to start. I just want to take about two minutes of your time, folks. I want to start our gathering. I want to start our gathering by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Huron peoples. And especially today, we have much to draw on from indig indigenous wisdom when it comes to how we manage our many natural resources. My name is Andrew Cardozo. I'm president of the Pearson Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this, to this discussion on energy innovation. So, formed in 2013, the Pearson Center is a centrist think tank that focuses on bold solutions to the complex changes we face. One of our main themes is the economy for tomorrow, hashtag econ for tomorrow, so please tweet. And the energy policy is, energy policy is one of those key issues. This, interestingly, is the third annual forum we've had on energy policy. In 2015, we had a session in Ottawa headlined by the then Minister of Energy, Bob Shirelli. In 2016, we had a forum in Calgary headlined by two federal ministers, uh, the Ministers of Natural Resources and the Environment, namely Jim Carr and Catherine McKenna. And today, we are very fortunate to host this session headlined with Minister Glenn Thibault as he has released a really important long-term energy plan. Welcome, Minister Glenn Thibault. It's always encouraging to see governments stop and really thinking about not just the short term, but the long term. And certainly in a complex area such as energy, it's all the more important. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, Bruce Power is our headline sponsor. The gold sponsors are Grasshopper, Grasshopper Energy, ITC Holdings, Nova Chemicals, the Ontario Real Estate Association, and I want to add Hatch, uh, which I regret is not is not on your program, but I want to thank them for being a sponsor and being here today. Alexander Stickler is their CEO with us today. Uh, special thanks to the organizing team, which included uh, Sandra Pupatello, Sandra Leffler, and Chris Benedetti. I want to tell you about uh, the, door, the door prize. I hope you've all put your, your business cards in. Um, if you haven't, we'll have people walking around with bowls. Uh, to, you can throw your cards in and we'll draw at the end. As a think tank, we believe that um, we, should have, um, we should have books. So there are two books. One is uh, the last biography that was written while Stephen, about Stephen Harper while he was in office, and the first biography written about Justin Trudeau when he was in office, and he is, uh, since he assumed uh, office. Uh, but to go with that as a think tank, we really feel it's important that you also have a nice glass of red wine. So the third door prize is a Kevin O'Leary wine. This is true. There is such a thing as a Kevin O'Leary wine. It's a bold, strong wine. I personally like it and recommend it, but I do say some people find it has an uncertain aftertaste. I just want to tell you that our next event is on infrastructure in Mississauga and Brampton, and you will see this uh, green uh, sheet on your, on your tables. Um, the key, this, we have four keynote speakers who include the Federal Minister of Infrastructure, Amarjeet Sohi, um, his provincial counterpart, Bob Shirelli, and the mayors of Mississauga and, and Brampton, uh, Mayor Bonnie Crombie and Linda Jeffrey. I want to recognize some of our board members who are here, Kathy Cotras, Natasha Bronfman, and Sandra Pupatello, who will moderate the panel. I'll just say a word about Sandra now. Uh, you probably know she's a senior management consultant, and many of you will know her as a senior and very effective minister uh, in the Ontario government, formerly in various portfolios, including trade and economic development. We just know her as a tour de force on our board. Uh, so Sandra will be back here at 1 o'clock to moderate the discussion. Uh, panel uh, with you and uh, enjoy your lunch in the meantime. Thank you. And remember, there's a there's a purse somebody left behind at the at the uh, at the registration table. Thank you, everybody. Okay, folks, we're ready to roll with the panel discussion. I'm just I'm just going to say a bit about this while they're fighting. Um, 
People thought that when I talked about the Kevin O'Leary wine, I made it up. I didn't. Here it is. This is the Kevin O'Leary wine. The label looks a lot like a, an American dollar uh, design. And I just want to read you a little bit about the back of it. So he says, if you, like your, if you like your reds big, bold, and brimming with flavor like I do, look no further. If I put my name on it, it's spectacular. This is him, not me. That's why they call me Mr. Wonderful. The only shark you can trust about wine. Try it with your family and friends and tell me what you think. So whoever wins that, you have an, you have an invitation to go and have a chat with Kevin O'Leary and tell, tell him what he thinks. With that, I'll turn it over to Sandra Pupatello. To good afternoon. The panel. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Pearson Center. We're delighted to have you here. Um, we're actually more delighted to have the Minister of Energy here, and it's uh, it turned out to be quite coincidental that once we booked the date to have the minister and this august panel speaking about energy and the future, that in the end I think they tailored the tabling of their long-term energy plan to coincide with this lunch. Yeah. So we think that everybody who received this on the way in, you were so busy reading the book that you haven't had a chance to eat. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the minister tabled today, but the focus, as Andrew mentioned, for the Pearson Center is engaging in a national debate about the things that matter. That's what the Pearson Center does and I'm delighted to volunteer as the chair of that board this year, and we welcome people to participate in a lot of the discussions that we have. Public policy is really important, and it's really important when the business community and nonprofit communities get involved in helping government develop good public policy. That's what the Pearson Center does. So we're delighted, Minister, to welcome you here. Let me tell you very briefly, because when you're in the energy business, you know these two people on the panel. Lisa DeMarco is a well-known lawyer in town, and she's got a boutique law firm, probably one of the first of its kind, that is in the climate energy space. And we're delighted that Lisa's joining the panel today. Kim, many of you will know as a regulator. Well, he retired from the IESO after an illustrious career uh, as a regulator, is now with Sussex Strategy and on the board of Enerstore. So we're delighted that you've joined us on the panel as well. Minister, you've been an MPP for a few years already, and you've had a very busy week. And I know some of your staff who are here in the crowd, they've barely slept in helping you prepare the launch of your long-term energy plan. We haven't had one in Ontario since 2013, and this is really important. It becomes a blueprint for people like us in the audience to see where the government plans to go. So let me turn to you first. If you could give us some high-level comments. Not everybody was stuffed into the, into the uh, locker room this morning listening, um, but if you can give some highlights about what you intended to do. Sure. Um, so, first off, good afternoon, everyone. Oh my God, have a coffee. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Much, much better. First off, thanks, uh, Lisa and uh, Kim, for uh, you know, joining me in this today. You're a regulator. That is extremely cool. You ever see, like, what was it? The, what movie was it? The Cowboy Guys were all called Regulators. Oh, Young Guns. Yeah. It was Young Guns. Guns Anyways. That, that would be exciting to be called a regulator. Um, also want to acknowledge uh, my cabinet colleague here, uh, David Zimmer, uh, Minister of Indigenous uh, Relations and Reconciliation. I also saw um, Ontario Regional Chief Day. He was here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still in the room or not, but um, Chief Day uh, has been uh, instrumental in, in working with us and working together. And, and the collaboration that we have with our First Nations and through the, uh, through the Chiefs of Ontario is fantastic. So I want to acknowledge uh, Chief Day and the great work that he and his team are doing. I also have um, my parliamentary, my new parliamentary assistant, uh, Nathalie de Rosier, is here as well. Um, my former parliamentary assistant, uh, Bob Delaney, who uh, has now moved on to infrastructure. Bob, I know you're around here somewhere as well. Bob's right over there. Thanks uh, for all of your work, Bob. And Bob was also key and instrumental in helping us uh, with uh, bringing forward the plan that uh, you all have today. And I also believe just one more uh, person I'd like to recognize, which is Sophie Kowala. Um, is Sophie here as well? She's uh, MPP from Kingston. 
Um, she was supposed to be hanging out with me today. Um, anyways, wow, it's been an interesting day, exciting day, um, because really we've been able to deliver our third long-term energy plan. And I know it was mentioned, it's great when governments can come together and talk about not just short-term thinking, not just thinking for an, electric, elect, uh, an election cycle, but electricity and energy for 20 years plus. And so rather than me have a, a long, drawn-out uh, politician's speech, I'd much rather uh, have a dialogue with Lisa and Kim because I know the, the knowledge that they bring to this sector and the important um, aspect that they can bring. But really, we talked about, I think, on the cover of the um, long-term energy plan, it says fairness and choice. Um, but the, I think the subtitle should be innovation as well. And I know the importance of innovation to this sector. I know the importance of innovation to all of you, um, to all of your businesses. And, uh, you know, with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it open for a dialogue. But thank you, everyone, for coming today. And uh, thank you again for all of your support and our opportunity to work together. Excellent. Thank you, Minister. Very good. Now, Andrew mentioned early on that there will be cards coming around, a microphone coming around, and you have a rare opportunity to literally stand up and ask a question of the minister and the panelists, and we're going to make sure we leave time towards the end of this. We're delighted you could come. We know you had question periods, so we couldn't start a lunch as early as we ordinarily would. Um, so we're delighted that you managed to get here. Uh, let me start with our panelists, because it's true, the minister mentioned innovation. And on page 37, it's going to be the, the focus. Everyone who's in business of energy is going to say, what's the demand going to look like over the next 30 years? And when you see that graph and it looks like a flat line, um, you've got some work to do with your shareholders. How are you going to manage this? And the answer is going to be around innovation. And uh, our two panelists talk about this all the time. Lisa, do you want to take your first crack on what you think their response is going to be and what it should be potentially? I think there are a couple of really big pieces in this plan. And I had to laugh, Minister, when you got the question or the comment from the press this morning saying, this is a no drama plan. And for any of us, actually all of us, who have been in the space of change throughout the course of this energy industry, this is a big drama plan. You know, this is evidence that you have, you collectively, and I'm looking at, you know, Dave Butters and Mayo and everyone in the room who's been a part of this, have collectively decarbonized the electricity sector. The plan does exactly what the OECD and the International Agency, Energy Agency said to do two years ago for 2050. It's all in this plan. All five steps in their report you have accomplished already. So a couple of the key aspects that I think we really should have, a, have an American moment about instead of just kind of sitting back and saying, okay, what can we do better? Um, take some credit for have a moment and say, congratulations, all of you. A couple of the big features are the innovation chapter, energy storage, front and center, near and dear to my own heart, working coordinatedly in a very optimized fashion with existing assets, optimizing what we've got. First Nations. Canadian, huge issue. Energy poverty in our First Nations communities. Whole chapter. Coordination with climate and not treating energy as a silo and environment as a silo and innovation as yet a third silo. We've got all three integrated in this plan. So if I were talking to my CEO, Sandra, I would say, We've got opportunity. It's time to make hay. It's time to once again roll up our sleeves and look how we all work together in a coordinated fashion among the different segments of our Ontario energy sector to keep on leading the world. But last but not least, take credit for what's already being done. It's very impressive. 
Okay, very good. Kim, if you're looking at this plan now and looking at sort of the history of the last 10 years, where we're going out the next 10, um, what would you tell companies in this room uh, that should be their priority? Well, there's certainly going to be lot, lots of opportunities if, for them to advance their position within the marketplace. I mean, the, the plan builds on a lot of activities that are, that are, that are starting to move and are already underway, some regulatory reform, there's market renewal, there is nuclear refurbishments, and they're continuing through this plan. But it also opens the door for a lot of new players and a lot of new innovations that Minister spoke to, uh, whether that be around marrying in the, all the distributed energy resources that are certainly coming our way, and they're going to come at light speed. Um, but it also starts to build on storage, certainly is it a, an example of how we could take better or more of a competitive advantage with, with our carbon-free resources. And it starts to lay that groundwork that's going to allow LDCs and grid operators and even the consumer to evolve and be more innovative as they sort of, you know, reach out, do business plans, new business models, and sort of adapt and, and, and start to accept the, you know, the myriad of, of new toys that are going to come at us that we haven't even thought of yet, right? But it starts to accept the fact that that change is going to become a reality and we're all going to start to move forward together. And it's, it's, it, it's, not, it's not overly prescriptive. It's an enabling document, sort of. It, it sort of is, allows that transition now to actually start to gain some momentum, and we'll start moving towards a, a, even a, a cleaner economy in what we have today. Okay. So, Minister, can you take us through the response that you'll have for big business, medium-sized businesses when they look at their pricing and what people can be expecting there that, you know, Predictability is always key. Uh, the system, though, in Ontario, compared to most places, we are extremely predictable as a system. Mm -hmm. Pricing has to be predictable. <clears throat> and in light of what is happening, say, south of the border, where they're starting to you know, reopen coal plants, potentially, and that sort of thing, <coughs> how are we going to stack up on the competitive front? Um, we stack up very well. If you look at the uh, United States um, uh, information uh, administration, and I might have the actual title of that uh, administration um, not entirely accurate, but they're talking about how we have some of the, the lowest rates in North America. And so, you know, as the Minister of Energy, I, I see things from one side, and I also see it from the point of being the only MPP that comes from a region that has two smelters in a city. And so I hear from many of our large industry uh, players, for example, in Sudbury, it's Valley and Glencore, about their concern about energy. And so we talk often about where we currently are, especially with Northern Ontario, there are programs in place that help keep um, our large industry competitive. So the NIRP or NIR program, depending on which part of Northern Ontario you're from, Minister Gravel calls it NIRP, I call it NIR, and then he comes to Sudbury and we'll switch it. But um, really there are programs in place to help keep them competitive. And the one thing that this plan also shows, not that I want to keep saying turn to page this and turn mm. to page that, <laughs> but you'll see that we're actually keeping um, our cost for our large industry to the cost of inflation. And so we're going to continue to, to work um, and, and roll up our sleeves as the ministry to find ways that we can continue to pull costs out of the system to help our large industry. You know, even the Fair Hydro plan um, helped our large industry. Most of that focus, the 25%, was on um, residential customers and providing that 25% relief to them and to 500,000 small businesses and farms. But what we also did as a government is we made a decision that, you know what, we have social programs that are on the rate base. These social programs should not be on the rate base. These are value-based decisions that we make as a government. Those should be on the tax base. So by pulling those programs off, and for those of you that uh, don't know what the, they are, it's the Ontario Electricity Support Program. It's the Triple RP, so the Rural Remote Rate Protection Plan. Um, the Affordability Fund that we just announced, um, what day is today? Thursday? <laughs> what day did I announce that? Tuesday, maybe? When was it? Yesterday? Yeah, it's been kind of a busy week. Um, anyways, the Affordability Fund, all of those things are no longer on the rate base. And so that can be anywhere between a 2 and a 4% decrease for our industry. And I know it's modest, but it again helps keep costs low, helps keep us competitive. And when you're looking at the importance of what we've done and, uh, you know, building on what Lisa has said and what, what Kim has said, let's be proud of what we have built. We are the tip of the spear 
we have no longer have coal as part of our generation, our supply generation. And, you know, I see, I forget your name from the Asthma Society. Vanessa? Vanessa? Yeah. So Vanessa was at uh, uh, Queen's Park with Matthew. And Matthew um, is my favorite story to tell because as a politician, it's so important for me. Because we're going to talk about um, big numbers, right? Closing coal is like taking 7 million cars off of the road. It's like saving $4.3 billion in our healthcare system, $70 billion over you know, uh, the duration of our, our refurb that's happening at OPG and Bruce. But we had Matthew and his family come to Queen's Park to say thanks. Because Matthew hasn't had to go to the hospital, in, in my understanding, it's been a year and a half. Because he has asthma so bad that the air, the quality of our air, our air used to be so bad that he was constantly at the, at the hospital. It makes it chokes me up a little bit. Mm. Um, and that's true when I say that, because as a politician, we can get overwhelmed with the big numbers. Look at this, seven million cars off the road. It's the biggest climate change reduction, you know, GHG reduction that we've done anywhere in North America. But we forget about the Matthews and the thousands of other Matthews that are out there that have actually had their quality of life improved because of all of you because of all of you have listened to what we've been saying as a government and saying we need to get better, we need to do better. And that's what this plan talks about. It talks about the innovation. It talks about getting better so we can talk about more Matthews. And so what drives me? What do I wake up every morning for and say, you know what, do I want to go through this grind again? I absolutely do because at the end of the day, it's making sure that my 14-year-old daughter and my 10-year-old daughter um, don't always come and ask me for 20 bucks. Um, I get a text. I'll probably get a call. School's going to end shortly. It'll be like, Dad, when are you home? I need 20 bucks. But how many here have teenage daughters? Raise your hand. <laughs> right after this, we're starting a counseling group just outside. <laughs> need some help. But really, you know, not to make light of this, we can do better. This plan is that guiding book to make sure that we can find ways to utilize all of our system that we have built together, make this a better system. Very good. Well, let's get into some specifics about what's changed and what innovation opportunity there could be. Kim, are you, have you memorized this book yet that you can pull out what you see as a, a significant uh, regulation change, for example? You're a regulator. You should be able to. <laughs> no big pressure there. I, I was in regulatory affairs for like 24 months. <laughs> and I just learned how to spell it and I went back to operations. So. Uh, well, obviously, I'm a, I'm a fan of storage. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why I joined the board at Interstore. And, uh, but, but that said, you know, it, prior to, to the time I left the ISO, we, we, we saw changing needs within the system, this, the need for this system to be uh, more nimble and more flexible than where it was and where it was going. Uh, and that's the way we're incorporating large, large amounts of other renewables, such as wind and solar and the like. But you can see that on the consumer side, they're getting more engaged. You know, the, the gone were the typical load patterns and shapes that you would see at any point in time. They're starting to react to price, and and they do different things during weather fronts now that they've ever done before. So, you know, I, we could see a need to, uh, for increased system resiliency. So that brings on distributed uh, resources. And there was the Hurricane Sandys of the world that came up through the eastern seaboard, and you saw what happened in the United States. And there were small pockets of you know, micro communities that were able to survive for an extended period of times, and you start to marry that with a system, that's when you start to really maximize benefits, when you start to take advantage of the diversities or increased diversity. So as far as new technology and stuff, you know, the LTEP speaks to the fact that there's needs for regulatory change and perhaps relax some of the rules that were never intended for these resources in the first place. I mean, they were intended for, you know, major grid, large assets, move them in on big transmission into the load center. I mean, that's the way that Ontario Hydro designed the system that, that's evolving now today. So it's starting to break down some of those, uh, they like to call them barrier strength tree. It always drove me nuts when I was a COO, but whatever. I like to think of some of them as guardrails, not barriers, but... Uh, but there are some areas that of necessary change, and that would be the biggest one for me to start to so allow those So if you're a business or yeah. you're a resident, you can now generate your own power, not take electrons from the grid until you have to, and if you 
have applied and are successful, you can also put your electrons back onto well, the you have that Well, you have that opportunity or that option, or and, you can choose not to. And you now choice. you have the opportunity for third party participation in that. That's so that, correct, that's the and right perhaps so, not attract certain charges that right. are out there today. Right, so big users, for example, yeah. could bring in third party. Um, they don't have to have that Or small, uh, cost or aggregators, asset. right? Right, right. Uh, but it allows LDCs to potentially start to provide new services that they've never done before So they in the can past. get involved in generation sure. themselves and uh, do that with, you know, whatever variety, whether that's wind or solar, or have their, start their own little solar company uh -huh. if they choose. And then systems and systems uh, controls become much more prominent than they were. So we've got some of those people in the room. I know Harry's here. Harry and I used to work together. Where's Harry? Harry's here. Aren't you a systems guy? I think you're a software system guy. But this type of innovation that's gotta, that's gotta get much more involved and not just for the big players, it's really going to come down to households, isn't it? So I think we have opportunity for new industry almost versioning here. Well, I don't know, sorry. Was there a you. question? I no, was, just I was a waving comment at people on, in the audience. I'm like, well, hey, and hey. as far as big, you know, <laughs> as far as big change, right? As far as big change, like what's changed here? What what were people complaining about that you fixed in terms of regulatory control? What it, what have you relaxed? Lisa, have you got a comment yeah, there? There are a couple biggies that um, first of all, there were a number of anachronisms, outdated rules in the system that really did, and I'm gonna use the word Kim, <laughs> cause barriers to innovation, not to, to particularly to storage. We had the, and it's not anybody's fault, the market design rules were drafted before storage was a twinkle in many people's eye. And the OEB processes and procedures were drafted at a time when innovation wasn't as prominent. They were a straight economic regulator. And now we've got a climate change regulation and regulatory system, and we needed to get some of those regulations fixed. So the global adjustment applying to storage, particularly having it paid only wholesale rates, but it when it was actually generating, mm -hmm. and paying retail rates when it's charging was out of whack. And then for the LDCs in the crowd, I think a number of them have some battle scars in going before the, the regulator and trying to push forward a few innovations and the regulator saying that's not within the scope of my mandate here. And there's some really good stuff in here about changing the culture around innovation. Some flexibility, a whole chapter on flexibility that speaks really directly, I think, should be music to the ears of many LDCs in the crowd. So suggesting then that when they put those costs forward before the regulator, they're going to be approved. Is that what you think? I wouldn't say they'll necessarily definitely be approved, but there's more flexibility. There's more realm for consideration of how these get integrated into the system in or outside of rate base. And so the plan really speaks to that. There's one other little gem in there that I love. It's tiny, but it's really near and dear to me. We don't do a great job at capitalizing on our brilliant innovations. We have, in my view, one of the best education systems in the world. We have fantastic initial commercialization. And then we're pretty, I'm gonna use the word crappy on the record, at scoping and scaling and exporting our innovations. So there's a tiny little bullet in the plan that speaks to uh, providing some support, some funding and financing support for assisting Ontario entities that innovate in getting those innovations overseas and into other markets. And that is a new $10 million mm -hmm. program, right? Is, when is that gonna launch? Probably soon? No pressure, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, Andrew, your the one chief, thing of my staff chief of staff is staff looking said, at Don't you. say any dates. Um, <laughs> so it's soon. Um, is it this year, do you think? We need, we need to get that out the door quickly. Um, I recognize that, um, as, as Lisa was saying, that we have fantastic innovation that's happening here in Ontario. And it's happening already, right? We can look at Opus One and the great work that Opus One is doing to make sure that, you know, this is getting out around the world. And 
Sorry, Harry, not to try and single you out again. Yeah, that's, um, but, that's a you know, lot it's, of airtime for yeah, Harry. Yeah, sorry. Well, then I'll try and single someone else out after, <laughs> I promise. Um, but truly, the technology that we have and that we're creating here is, I use the word tip of the spear all the time, because, because of the decisions that were made by our government when you were around, um, truly has led us to where we are today. Did we do everything perfectly? Absolutely not, right? Hindsight has 2020. But that's where we now need to come forward with storage and changing some of the rules to make sure that we can actually use it more, right? None of us in this room think this, but when you go and turn your light on, it just doesn't magically appear. There's a whole system that comes in place. My two daughters think it's magic. So does if Frank's here from Greater Sudbury Utilities, my bill might also think it's magic too, because my wife doesn't understand time of use and laundry, but I'm working on that. Well, that's because I'm supposed to do my just own laundry. Just start doing the laundry, right? exactly. exactly. So that's just... You knew gonna, that was coming. I'm yeah. going to get in shit now. I know it. <laughs> Anyways. So, okay, is this a good time to point out your socks? I have, wearing, I, uh, have, I have... I have... ACDC Well, so, I, the, so it's Dirty it's Deeds Done cool. Dirt Cheap, right? So it's the album covers. But it's ACDC because that's the only thing that I could really get close to, to electricity. It's very so, cool. So, but... <laughs> I found and that. you always have to have a little bit of rock and roll in everything you do, I right? Know, but it's true. I have searched for a really cool pair of like Minister of Energy socks. I haven't okay. been able We're to find them. We're putting a call yet. out right now. So, if it, you can't give them to me as a gift, I have to pay you for them. That's right. That's okay. However, if you see uh, a pair of really cool socks that I should have as the Minister of Energy, please call Andrew Telezuski. There we go. Um, <laughs> Let me let there me know go. where they are, and we will then get them so I can actually wear something that's well. No, I think you know ACDC. I was kind of showing them off a little bit. I thought they were pretty cool today. We needed to mention them. It's they look very good. From 1980s. Right? You're hot. You're you're just right on it. I it's think I'm actually beating it's the good. prime minister on sock game today. He had R2D2 and C3PO last time his sock game. Oh, was did on. he? I think I won today. <laughs> I do okay. It. So what are yours? We've got to check. We're in. almost ready to go to the crowd for World questions. Series. <laughs> He's got World yeah. Series socks. Oh, World Series Baseball. socks. Okay. I'm Lisa, sorry. you and I are right out on I this know. conversation. Windsor you know. girls. Two exactly. Windsor girls. Two That's Windsor girls. You can't beat we don't that. wear socks. Now we, we do want to get some questions from the crowd. Uh, but we've got a terrific panel here with great insight in. So ask them your comment. Opine on the future. Uh, and for our minister, it's great to have an opportunity to have you take the floor like this in an informal fashion. That you don't, uh, you know. Uh, you don't have to worry that uh, you've got people who are in the know here in this audience. Have we got any questions out there? And do me a favor, when you stand up, tell us who you are and where you come from in this uh, field. It's at the back, Margaret. We'll get to, we'll oh. get to you in a second, Margaret. Okay, well, she's got the mic. Okay, give us yep. two seconds. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. It I'll try to be quick. My name's Ian Noakes from the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Uh, on page 37, your demand chart, um, I think our highest peak use in Ontario was something like 27,000 megawatts. How, with that flat demand curve going forward, uh, you're also committed to um, utilizing, expanding natural gas infrastructure. How do you marry that going forward that um, our demand is flat or, or maybe even going down? and the fact that a lot of Ontario doesn't have access to natural gas and wants it. So with the risk of that reducing electricity demand even further, how, how is that gonna work out? So, so I, don't, I don't see demand going down. What I see for this is a very slow increase, but you know, I, I, I'm not sure if it was mentioned earlier, but we're talking about 2.4 million electric vehicles that we have a goal to get to by 2030, 2035. So we're going to see more demand for electricity as we move forward. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about natural gas, you know, we are going to continue to push. We do have a $100 million program that uh, my colleague, Minister Chirelli, from the Minister of Infrastructure, is looking at getting out to communities. I know his, his PA, my former PA, is here. So, you know, these two things um, are allowed to, what the front of this document says is providing choice. Many ratepayers um, are looking for that choice. I'm lucky in Sudbury that I do have that choice. I have the choice of natural gas, and I also have the, the, the choice of electricity to heat my home. But we also know 
through the innovation, I'm gonna, if everyone's counting how many times we say innovation to take a drink, I think we're up 20 now, so good for you. But the innovation, there's another one, that we have in this sector is really gonna allow us to drive that, the, the homes that we're gonna build that you can actually have one baseboard heater to actually heat your own home. I know that's already there because I was a part of an announcement close to North Bay where a First Nations community is building their home with such insulation and with such um, stability that they only need one baseboard heater to heat their home in the summer and then uh, heat their home in the winter and then in the summer being at, able to access again keeping their, whole, their, their home cool because they don't necessarily need to actually turn on AC because they've been able to keep the heat out. So all in all innovation is going to be key in this because at the end of the day we're going to see more um, uptake when it comes to electricity, but also making sure that we can roll out natural gas to give some choices to people and at the same time keep our, our GHGs down. Anyone Very else want to add to that? Um, we've got a question up here. This is going to be no. number two and then we're going to come over here. Can we get the microphone? Thanks. I could probably hear you, Margaret, if you want to ask. And I probably don't need a microphone. Oh, we'll repeat the question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's always a mistake to give me a microphone. Mm -hmm. My name is Margaret Kinehuanash. My role today, um, my job is uh, CEO of Watene Ginyap. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for um, once again acknowledging um, that uh, the remote First Nations connection is a priority on behalf of the government of Ontario, and also acknowledging that Watene Ginyap is a proponent. However, this is the third long-term energy plan that we've received that kind of acknowledgement. I've been at this for 10 years, and I think uh, it's time, rather than just to say we have a commitment, it's time for action. It's time to do something in terms of connecting the remote First Nations. If the regional chief is here, you're listening to me if you're here, and I'm gonna need your help on this one. And I, I uh, just wanted to say thank you for that commitment. However, we need to move it a step forward and to actually begin the work to connect the remote First Nations, to bring them onto that transmission line, to connect them to the provincial grid. This is a, 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 a force of 22 First Nations working together collectively and um, has been a, a strong focus to bring this energy, reliable, accessible energy into the north. I think you're well aware of it. I just wanted to say now is time to take action. And yes, we appreciate the acknowledgement and also the commitment to that this project is a priority and will continue to be. Uh, I know it took us some years to bring it up to where it is at today, given when this whole process of IPSP started way back in 2009 during Smitherman days. Um, we had to bring it into the map, um, the north, into, into the overall planning process. So we have a plan. It's a win-win situation for all. Let's get moving on it. Thank you so much. Thanks for your comment. Very good. We already have a mic here. Yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Hamel Bassi from Cambridge. Uh, Sandra, is it okay to ask a political question? Um, it depends on the question. I'm going to let you know. It, it, it <laughs> okay. It, it, uh, it starts uh, off. It, it starts off uh, a little low key, but it, it, it ends on a high note. <laughs> now, now. It sounds like now you got that, an essay there. We want a question. No, no. It's, it's, it's okay. four lines. Now that um, uh, the, the province has, has diverted uh, Hydro One, and you know what's done is done. Uh, will will you encourage other mega merged LDCs to divest from their owners and unleash innovation? I minister. Oh, that's that's totally a fair question, yeah. um, and that wasn't political. I thought we that were going to be able uh, to say something about my opposition friends. Right. So that's. <laughs> yeah, I had a Twitter fight actually with Stockwell. If you guys remember Chris Stockwell. I was promoting this event, and he started taking off on me like he used to do when we were in the house together. Yep. And I said, oh, you were the environment minister when your ener you helped the uh, energy minister roll diesel generators into downtown Toronto in the middle of July 
just in case they didn't have enough power. That's what they did in about 1997. I didn't get political. Congratulations right. on <laughs> right. This is great. That's not Ask even political. Ask all the political questions you want. I'm going to defer. See, I, you can only be political like that when you're being honest. But that yes, was that's absolutely true. the truth. And he had yep. to admit that because yeah. it was bared at the time and they literally rolled in diesel gen you, you remember that, Hydro One. You got a whole table over here. Yeah. I know you remember so, that. So let me, let me, let me talk about what we're, <laughs> what we're going to be doing with, I can, I'll, I'm going to talk about Hydro One in a second, but in terms of LDC, we're going to continue to move forward with voluntary consolidation. We're seeing more and more of that happening to the benefits of ratepayers. Electra, I know there's talk now with, with Guelph. Um, there's many uh, others that are, have been looked at and some that's happening. When it comes to, you know, the broadening of ownership of Hydro One, at the end of the day, that was absolutely the right thing to do. I'll take that 20 bucks later, Mayo. But it was the right thing to do. And what I mean by that is, look at how they've become as a company, right? Winter disconnections, voluntarily stepped forward, right? Actually ended that. I just had St. Albert's cheese. Anyone ever go to St. Albert's cheese? Oh, fantastic way to have poutine. Didn't have to eat for a week after that. But you know what? They actually said no, what was it, four years ago? Right? Couldn't help, uh, couldn't help St. Albert's cheese out after their place had burnt down. They rebuilt, they were expanding, um, gonna create jobs, gonna grow their business. But at the time, Hydro One said, no, we couldn't do that. We can't help you with that. Doesn't fit our plan. Came back and fixed it and said yes. And now they're growing. They're gonna create more jobs in their community. They're actually gonna to continue to grow and Hydro One wants to be that player. And now you're telling me you're looking at all of these plans that used to say no and trying to fix that. Which is why we did what we did as a government, right? We made sure that we're unleashing the opportunities to see this company grow into what they, they can and will be um, and are continuing to be leaders for us. We're utilizing them and their experience and their expertise to help us looking at bill presentment. Why is it that we're treating, and I know many of you in this room feel this way, but why is it that we're treating every single ratepayer like they're, they're an energy expert? They don't understand their bills. Right, Francesca? Right? Right? Francesca Dobbin from the United Way and uh, Owen Sound. What's your actual title? The, I know your title, but the, the name of Owen Sound, you call United it? United Way Bruce Gray. Bruce Gray. So you're giving up a day of campaigning today, so thanks for coming out today. Everyone make a donation out to where you are to offset the cost of you being out here. As an old United Way executive director, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a plug and help you with that. <laughs> but really, Hydro One has recognized the importance of actually helping um, our rural ratepayers and helping others, so that was the right thing to do. We're going to continue moving forward with our voluntary consolidation, but we're also going to look to our LDCs to provide us with some of the leadership that they all know when it comes to the innovation that we want to see happening right across our province. So no forced mergers is what you're saying? Voluntary consolidation. Okay, uh, but you're encouraging it because you see the Voluntary consolidation, right Andrew? Voluntary <laughs> consolidation. Okay. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Ralph Chatur, the Society of Energy Professionals. I would like to um, acknowledge the, um, the minister in, in uh, recognizing the critical role that unions play in the province. On page 49, you pointed out um, the contribution that our uh, skilled uh, men and women bring to the fore in running the nuclear plants. Thank you. Uh, question. Um, you, we speak a lot of innovation. If we are to be true to innovation, we have to bring our technologies to fruition with speed. Uh, I've worked on the regulatory side for many, many years, and the one fly in the ointment always seems to be regulatory, bureaucratic, stumbling and bumbling. Um, can you advise on what the government's doing by way of um, revamping regulations so that we are not at a disadvantage, so some of the barriers to bringing innovation are de-escalated? Thank you. I should let others get in on this, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit first, and then if anyone has some, some comments, otherwise I'll be hogging the mic. But um, this is the document for innovation, right? We're talking about that. We keep talking about that importance. But we need to make sure that our regulation advances as well. Um, from our regulator to our system operator to all involved, we need to make sure that we provide um, those opportunities, updating to make sure that we're keeping with the new technology that's happening. I still get this comment often, right? Congratulations, Glenn, on being appointed to cabinet. It must be a great opportunity for you, but wow, did you ever get that crappy portfolio? 
right? And I, I've said that so many times because I don't see it this way. Yes, I've got the politics of this portfolio, and I actually don't mind that. That's why you get into politics for that, that cut and thrust. But what I'm absolutely blown away by is when I actually go to any one of your facilities, right? And hear about the technology that you're bringing forward and the change that you can make. We're, I'm encouraged by that because I know that we're on that tipping point of making everything better. But we now gotta make sure that our regulation keeps up with that, that innovation. And so we talk a lot about those changes that we can make in this document, but I know there's more that I need to do. I know I need to roll up my sleeves. I know I need to work with the ISO. Um, you know, Bruce Cram Campbell did some great work. Uh, I know he retired, but Peter Gregg, I don't know, Peter, if you're in the room, but the vision that you have and where we're taking this, uh, uh, this province, I'm, I'm blown away by and I'm so pleased to have you there. Peter, are you here? Am I singling him out? No? Good. Oh, well. So let's say something bad about him now because he's not here. <laughs> but anyways, it's just, you know what, we, we, we recognize that, we're going to be moving on it and uh, it, it is an important piece for us to go from, even from our, our regulator to our system operator, having a good vision. Does anyone want to add Lisa, comments to that? Lisa, Kim, yeah, on... Uh, one of the things I, I like about the plan is that it's very Canadian. It's not all or nothing, anything. It's not radical departures and stranding assets. And it's not radical historical utility modeling. There's a nice balance in the plan. So to the extent that we can shape the implementation, there are a couple of real opportunities. And is this where I get to be controversial, Sam? Definitely. Um, if it's implemented properly, there is opportunity to decrease the politicization of the energy sector through this balanced plan. And so uh, I'd love to say we're going to keep the pressure on, and we're going to keep the pressure on to make sure that we all continue to work together to realize the potential balance that the plan provides. Yeah, I'd just add that uh, I, I agree that there are times in the regulatory side of the equation that can be, can be an impediment uh, to a certain degree, but there's also they are trying to look, there's a, there is a balance because you're trying to look after the ratepayers' interests here, so it's not a free-for-all either. Um, the ISO did move forward on alternative technologies, uh, a move afoot on that about four or five years ago. Some of those uh, projects are still in play. I, I do believe that the LTEP speaks to uh, IESO bringing forward pilot projects with, uh, with renewable projects or renewable resources in pilot form to again test the waters and determine where the correct value chain might be here going forward and it's sort of be the, the, the point uh, projects to actually indicate what regulatory areas need to, 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 uh, to be modified and, and if so, when and to what degree so we don't spin our wheels, frankly. Um, so I do think that there's elements that are gonna be beneficial for regulatory reform, certainly within the cell tech. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Oh, Harry. Hi. It's Harry. <laughs> Harry from uh, Opus One. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the shout outs, but also for the great LTAP. Um, I know it's the first one to focus on the distribution system and the innovation within that ecosystem, uh, and we're looking forward to working with our partners uh, in moving that along. Uh, but my question is, uh, I know the LTAP talks a lot about non wires <coughs> alternative, uh, its role, um, within the system and, and distributed energy generation and or resources within the interplay as well. I'm more interested from a planning perspective. It talks about the OEB, the IES, so really looking at distribution planning looking forward. Um, where do you, how do you see that playing out uh, in the next one or two years? Minister? Um, I, you're jumping, so you can go ahead. I'm thinking no. of my thoughts. Go ahead, no, go ahead, honestly. There's a really interesting point in the, um, in the plan itself that really speaks to... I feel like I'm cheating in high school here. I'm I looking know, at what page you're on. I'm on page 12 and I'm okay. on the second last bullet that says the government will direct the independent electricity system operator to establish a formal process for planning the future of the integrated province-wide bulk system. I think that integrated portion and then the planning aspect and bringing to bear the ISO's expertise is a pretty, pretty interesting bullet for us in the room. I, 
the the LDCs already do, a, frankly, a, a darn good job at planning within their areas. I think what this LTEP does is allow okay, them to bring more forward to even more, more uh, assets that they no, may not have otherwise done in the past on the you know more distributed uh, resources and then an opportunity to get cost recovery to make the necessary modifications to their systems that will allow a two-way flow. They were never designed to be two-way flows, right? They're going to be two-way flows. Some of them are already two-way flows, and you can get all kind. Of, you don't want to, I don't want to auger in, but there could be power quality issues. There's a lot of things that could fall out of that that they're going to need to manage. So you've created an environment now for them to be arguably more creative, and then a regular to have more understanding about the need for them to spend money to save money rather than make a request to spend money and get declined. Hmm. That's an interesting point. I'm going to ask, uh, unfortunately we have run out of time, but I want to give our panelists just a couple of minutes to wrap up some overarching comments, whether it's about this plan in particular, because we happened upon the date to time with the release of the plan, but you just sort of opine for a moment about what you see, uh, the good news, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, that we need to be careful of. Uh, energy is the backbone of the economy, in my view, and it's a, it's a mix of a lot of big companies with a lot of money and assets in the ground already, uh, and they need to know that they have a future, and then you want this burgeoning innovation class uh, merging with, with the system, and ideally the changes that we see in the plan table today is going to allow for more than that. Um, Kim, any overarching comments? Well, we're going to have a lot to do. Uh, it's already a busy sector. Uh, market renewal is making it busier, and, and arguably to, to move forward on, on, on new and distributed resources and such and storage and the like is going to make us that much, much more you know, uh, active. There's, there will be future need. There is, there is increases in, in load coming as we electrify, uh, you know, as we start to decarbonize, I say, and, and, and bring bring transportation and such towards the electricity side of the equation and beat it down with carbon-free resources. So there's, there's much to do. It's going to take an awful lot of, of heavy lifting to get it done. Uh, I'm thankful that we can build on the strengths that are already within the room. Uh, and I can say that now without buy I, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have some linkages to a few folks, but uh, I'm not going to be the one doing the heavy lifting. But there is a lot of expertise in this province that we can really tap and move forward. And it really does drive the economy of this province, and that's a great thing. Excellent. And uh, so I really look at it as a positive news environment, and it's, uh, it's good for everybody in here. Very good. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly following your theme, Sandra. Um, as I said at the beginning, the good is this is dramatic. This is really, really dramatic, and this didn't happen in a day. Some of you have been working on the culmination of elements that have found their way into this plan for 20. 30 years, so please, let's stop and take two minutes out to celebrate what I believe is very much a success. Uh, secondly, in terms of, okay, we're classically Canadian, we've taken our two minutes of self-congratulatory pat, back patting. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to implement this, but also there is a very burning problem, not just in the province, but in the country of energy poverty, particularly in First Nations com communities, not just rural and remote, unconnected, but existing connected communities. And we all need to get creative about how we solve that within the context of a system that works. And so I would say those are the two things where we should definitely focus on the good that we have done and keep on getting busy about what we can do. Excellent. Thanks. Minister. Page 109. <laughs> It's always a graph. That's our GHG reduction. To look at where we were in 2005 to where we're going to be. And you know, when we talked earlier about you know, what I get all the time as being the Minister of Energy, um, the one thing that is important for me um, ultimately at the end of the day is everyone in this room has worked together to create this. We're leading the globe, right, in terms of what we've been able to do with our electricity sector, our energy sector, and I always say energy because I am the Minister of Energy, not just the Minister of Electricity. Fuels do play an important role. But everyone has said it. You know, this is done. We're going to take our two minutes. Might have a beer later on just to say this is done. Um, but we roll up our sleeves and we get right back at it tomorrow because there's more work to do. 
And I am lucky that I have all of you in this room and other stakeholders that I rely on, that I can talk to, um, and that we can work together to actually achieve our, our, our economic goals, our healthcare goals, our environmental goals. But I also have a great team within my office, both with the deputy, um, all of his staff, Hillary, who was instrumental in making sure we all got this done. So Hillary, thank you for all of your hard work in helping us achieve that. And all of my staff from my ministry office, from my chief of staff, all the way down to my brand new MPP liaison, Riggs. <laughs> I love saying your last name. Riggs, it's awesome, right? <laughs> Anyone know very quickly, movie from? <laughs> There's lots in there. Lethal Weapon. Alien was one. <laughs> Lethal Weapon was another. <laughs> Alien oh, didn't right, go so well. Right, Pardon? Right. Alien didn't go so well. No. You have nothing in your stomach right now? All good. But anyways, if you can actually help me say thank you and give the staff from both uh, the, 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 the Deputy Minister's office and from my office a huge round of applause for all of their hard work on this. They, they truly were instrumental in making sure that this document got done, obviously. And, and Sandra, thank you to... Uh, um, the center and to Lisa and, and Kim as always thanks for joining me up here and always for your insight I much appreciate all of it so great. thanks thanks everyone what a great thank summary thank what you. a great summary thank you as, as the headline sponsor we'd ask Bruce Power to say a few words and they nominated instead Vanessa Foran uh, president and CEO of Asthma Canada Vanessa Thanks so much. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure, pleasure to be here with you today. Job. When holding an event like this, it's always very helpful to have a wealth of experience and knowledge from a range of experts in the field as we have had today. I want to thank our esteemed panel for their time, including Kim Warren, Lisa DeMarco, and the Honourable Minister of Energy, Glenn Thibault. I also would like to uh, thank you, Sandra Puputello, for being an excellent moderator, uh, and also uh, to Bruce Power for supporting this event. It is the ki it's this kind of open discussion and collective effort that will bring us closer to a cleaner, healthier, more sustainable world. Today, our world is truly at a tipping point. Tackling climate change presents many challenges as we transition to a low carbon economy. But by tackling these challenges, by lowering our emissions and investing in our future, we can already see the benefits today. Ontario continues to be a leader in reducing electricity sector air emissions and improving air quality. It is imperative we meet the growing global demands for electricity in a way that improves human life and protects the environment. Through its long-term planning process, the provincial government achieved the phase out of coal from its energy supply mix. The province has committed to the life extension of 10 nuclear units which will extend the life of these zero greenhouse gas operators for more than 30 years. This policy means that the province has set themselves up for success right through to the year 2064. And thanks to Ontario taking a leadership role in reducing emissions, the number of smog days in Toronto went from 53 in 2005 to zero in 2014. Quite an achievement. I can tell you that meeting growing energy demands in a clean and affordable way is possible, and Ontario is a perfect example of how it can be done. It has meant cleaner air in the province and improved health of Ontario's most vulnerable citizens, including those who live with asthma and other respiratory issues. There is no doubt that the world is changing. We are transitioning to a cleaner, greener world, one that will ensure a more sustainable and prosperous future for our planet. But this transition will not happen overnight. Long-term planning with non-emitting sources like nuclear power not only secures a clean, reliable, and affordable source of energy, but it also sets us up for success by allowing us to invest in innovation in the new clean growth economy. It ensures a more sustainable and prosperous future for our planet, for our children, and for our grandchildren. On behalf of Asthma Canada, I want to once again thank the panel for being here with us and for your continued support of clean energy sources. Thank you. And just quickly, the draw prize. 
draw prizes. The book on Stephen Harper goes to Juliana Kalin from Nest Labs. The book on, on Justin Trudeau goes to Carolyn Pittman from Spark Power. And for that all important bottle of wine, goes to Andrew Mitchell from TransCanada. <laughs> With the aftertaste. Thanks, everybody. And remember our event next week on infrastructure, Mississauga. I hope to see some of you there. Thank you for being here.